All right, welcome into the Denver Sports Podcast with Harrison Wynn. We're presented by Breckenridge Brewery. Uh, pick up a Breck Brew today. If you don't know where to get one, check out the Breck Brew Beer Locator on their website or stop into the DNVR bar. We got tons of Breck Brew on tap. My guest on the Denver Sports Podcast today, Eric Lacroix, former Avs player, former Avs front office exec, yes. now analyst with the DNVR Avalanche podcast thanks for joining me man i appreciate it you know sorry for the outfit it's snowing it's thanksgiving and yeah. uh, i didn't even realize i had a winter hat on until right now when i saw it on camera so we're and good. it's it's really chilly out yeah. today it's fitting that we're talking hockey on yeah. uh, tdsp today uh which of your career jobs has been your favorite though uh i'm gonna say now i'm not there being that's stacking. the right answer yeah that's yeah. the right answer no but i you know <laughs> but i'm i'm just being honest like it's fun because you're, when you're covering a team, and you know how it is with the Nuggets and all that stuff. You know, like it's, it's fun, and you you feel part of it. Um, I was saying that on the end, uh, at the end of a game, maybe last week, and AJ was all like mad, and I think the Avs had a tough night. Oh, it was that game. They they gave up two goals in the last mm-hmm. minute, and then AJ was oh, like, oh yeah, just the other night. <laughs> it was like yeah, it was like last week. And it was funny because it's, uh, cameras were turned off. Then we started talking, and it's like. You live for that stuff, you know what I yeah. mean? Whether you're a player, uh, you're a front office guy, or or you cover the team on the beat like this, like you you live with the wins, you live with the losses, and it's mm-hmm. it's a drug. It's my drug. I mean, that's just for me. It's it's the rush, and when it's not part of your life, you miss it. Mm-hmm. And I certainly do, and I've been part of parts of my life where you know I haven't been involved with a team or even in a market. For example, in Vegas, we were there for a few years. There was no team and. Mm-hmm. You just don't have that, you know, that that rush. And, yeah. you, and, it, and it's a void when it's not there or when there's a lockout or something like that. Sure. You know what I mean? It's just something that's missing. And for me, it's it's a big part of life. I love it. Uh, I love it, everything that I've done. But they're all different. You know, as a player, it's probably the easiest way to cope with it because you can do something about it, mm-hmm. right? And then, <laughs> or if you're covering, there's not much you can do about it. And as, as in management, well... Then at least you feel sometimes that you can pull some strings and you know to make something happen. So yeah. all three are different, or all three are fun, and uh, like I said, I couldn't live without it. Yeah. Well, like you mentioned, you've been involved in hockey for most of your life. Yeah. I want to go back to kind of the beginning though, because um, yeah. obviously you know growing up, your dad was GM of the Nordiques and then the Avs from '94 to 2006. Yeah. You grew up around the game. Yeah. Did you always think you were going to be a hockey player or involved in hockey to yeah. some extent. Yeah, it's a good question, and, and I get asked that. I got young kids of my uh, of my own, and I'm in rinks all the time, and and people think it it works a certain way, and it just doesn't. Um, uh, <laughs> there's no books on it. There's right. no right or wrong way to do things. Uh, before the Abs and the Nordiques, my dad was a, was an agent, mm-hmm. right? So for 25 years, so so for me. I grew up with superstar players from the NHL in my house. Uh, you know, you're talking about the Patty Waz and Denny Savard, Michelle Goulet, Hall of Famers, and you know they were in my house. And I was lucky enough because we're talking about names that made it, names that became Hall of Fame. But there was always along the way guys that didn't make it, guys that were first rounders and ended up playing five games in their careers. I, I was always fascinated, like how come. This guy that was a first rounder didn't make it. How come this mm. guy made it? And for me, since a young age, like of course I was biased, biased to my dad's clients, so I always followed them and their stats and everything. And I was, you know, like I said, involved in their lives. And so for for me, it was beneficial because I was able to put aside like, hey, what went wrong for this guy? What went right for that guy? And then I was the character. The, the thing I always came back was always about their character or how to deal with situations. And mm-hmm. then I realized it wasn't just about being good or, you know, attitude and right place at the right time had a lot to do with it. People tend to forget that. Hey, how'd you make it? Well, right play at the right time. Of course. My brother was way better player than I was. Uh, you know, smaller guy, fragile, skilled, different era back then. Mm-hmm. You know, more like you're talking about 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. My brother probably... If we're 25, 30 years later, he makes it, and I don't. Different so types your of brother players. didn't play in the NHL? No, my brother was drafted in the NHL, never played. We gotcha. played together in college. and But if you're talking about talent, like it's not even close. I mean, he's mm-hmm. right here, and I was here. you know. But I was a different type of player, right place at the right time for that era. 
Uh, so for me, growing up, I was lucky to see those things, and 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 that that was a big factor why you know I became a National Hockey League player. But but even people, I, I like I said, I go back to youth hockey. Um, I left home. I was 16. Um, unconventional way. I'm from Montreal, Canada. We went to my brother left before me. I went a couple years later to prep school in Massachusetts. Um, mm -hmm. Totally different, totally unheard of for people back home. They're like, what was wrong with these people? Where, where are they going? <laughs> we play 75 games here. They're going to play 22 games in prep school. What is, what's the matter? I thought this guy was an agent, the dad. And, you know, well, what we did, we did it for, for the life experiences. We didn't do it for hockey. Like, mm -hmm. my brother was there. I just went. Uh, my sophomore year in high school, I was honestly, I look like I look now, like a little bit heavier. And I was about 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five, and... I played on the fourth line. I scored one goal. I was awful. So you were more of a late bloomer. Absolutely. And the year before, like back home, I didn't even make those double A teams. Forget about triple A. Like I always say, between thirteen to eighteen, it's such a, especially for a contact sport, it's such a weird age because everybody grows differently and mature differently. And mm -hmm. so I went on to to become a, you know, my junior uh, year in high school. All of a sudden, I was six feet tall. You know, I slimmed out. I wasn't pudgy anymore, you know. I felt good about myself. I was like, all right, I had a decent year. And then my senior year, I was 6'2", 210, got drafted in the NHL. So when people say this is how it works, you got to do this, you got to do that, I say, right. no, I, I can tell you that's not how it works. And and then all of a sudden, you know, I went to college and played in the NHL like, what, 16 months later. So there is no right or right or wrong way to do it. Uh, I think it's more about the pace that you're at. Late bloomer era was... So for me, uh, I was lucky enough to have a passion and never lose passion for the game, and I was have fun with it. Mm -hmm. And then it worked out. I mean, that's how it is in life, though. There's well, never I, I, one route thing. to get anywhere. People always ask same me thing. about how I became a Nuggets analyst at DNVR. I don't know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> th there's a path I took, but yeah. it was kind of lucky. I was in the right place at the right time, and it worked out. So, I mean, you can apply that to every walk of life, it feels like. 100%. You're bang on. And, and, and it's any walks of life and, and right place at the right time. I, I'm a big believer you create your own luck, right? So you, I agree you with did that something. Too. I agree with that you too. You did something that made you yeah. be ready or at a certain place where you got the call, right? You know? yes. And then absolutely, and that's everybody. Uh, but you got to be at the right place. And, and luck has a lot to do with it a lot of times. And people tend to forget that. And then they look back and they either they're jealous or they go, oh, that's awesome. Or mm -hmm. they go, oh, God, he got so lucky. Well, then do something about it yourself, too, to see if you can put yourself in that situation where it can happen to yourself, too. Was there a moment that you look back on and you thought, OK, I, I can be in the NHL. I can make it. Is, is there a moment that comes to mind? Yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, my dad was an agent. Like I said, we always did the <laughs> Always us. It was grades first, you know. For me, I'm not gonna tell you I was the greatest student, but you know, we always made sure that we were good in school and mm -hmm. we was gonna open doors in life. And so I graduated uh, my senior year in high school, and uh, my dad was an agent. So my roommate high school was from from California. So my brother that was already in college, uh, big movie buffs, and we, you know, and, and again, I'm going back to my brother. Why did he go to prep school in Montreal? I don't know if you guys remember the Dead Poets Society, the movie, and my brother loved it, and I was, mm -hmm. oh, I want to go to prep school, and that's why, that's what he did, and wow, then I just, okay. yeah, it's, it's, that's the truth, and then I just followed him a couple years later, and now my dad's an agent. Every year, the draft used to be Montreal, give and take. NHL draft has always been in Montreal, so all those years, I was talking about that earlier, I used to go with my dad and his clients, and you know, kind of be the gopher and run around if they ever need anything, and my dad always had, you know, high profile clients and first rounders, and so that year, we just graduated. My brother had been in college. Where are we going? We're going to L.A. because the draft was in Vancouver. Let's mm -hmm. all go as a family. Like my mom, my brother, probably our last trip before we're all adults and all that kind of stuff. And so my roommate, uh, same thing in prep school, was, was from there. So we're all going to visit my roommate. We're all excited. Mm -hmm. uh, he went to the draft as well because his dad was working the draft and so we all end up in Vancouver, and on the way there, on the plane, and this is exactly to answer your question, when did I realize, like, oh, maybe I can play in the NHL? I was right there on the plane right to Vancouver where the draft was held. There was this place where Colleen was a guest on, on our show there with the NBR Avalanche a couple weeks ago, the Hockey News. Um, 
they always had the central scouting list right there. And we didn't have those things, those phones and the, you know, the lists and the computers. And what, did you just have a piece of paper? It was just a, it was a newspaper. Right. The hockey news. Yeah. Yeah. And then one of my dad's client, Carl Dykhouse was his name. He ended up being the first rounder of Chicago. He walked back a couple rows. I was there. And he said, is that you? And he shows me, like, I think I was ranked in the sixth round. And, you know, sure enough, it was me. You know, so I'm like, oh, yeah, it is me. And I was like, oh, man, that's cool. And I was like, what? I could get drafted, and that was so weird. And so you didn't know that you were thought of highly at all up no until idea. that point. I had no idea. You know what I mean? And and then we landed, and then I told my mom, not my dad, because I know what he would have said. No, 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 this is how it works. My dad was always about, if you're gonna, not gonna be a first rounder, you don't go to the draft. But mm-hmm. but we were, we were going there as a family, and that was it. So I told my mom, I'm like, hey, we gotta go get a suit when I get there. What if? You know what I mean? And what if? And then my brother, myself. And my buddy, my roommate, ended up going to get a cheap suit across the street because we're like, oh, Saturday when we're going there, we're going to have our suits on. And you never know. And sure enough, I tell you one thing. Now they're talking about a ball, making the draft a little different, the NHL draft. They're going to be like the NFL now. They're saying it's going to be decentralized uh, starting next year. And, you know, which I'm against because what I'm about to tell you. Like, So we were there and. I don't know. The first round's over. That takes forever. And then the next day is the second, third. Back then, there was only uh, 22, 23 teams when I got drafted. Now there's 32, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm old. I'm just giving out my age right now. But And then all of a sudden, uh, we uh, there was like a dozen rounds. And then sure enough, in the seventh round, like we're on the concourse at BC Place, this football stadium. <laughs> That's where the draft was that year in Vancouver. And then and you hear on the microphone, like, you know, from Governor Dummer Academy, which is my prep school. And I'm like, I looked at my buddy and we're like, we're, in our minds, we were the best, the two best players on the team. You know what uh-huh. I mean? And Mike Gilbert. And I'm like, what? It wasn't either of us. <laughs> so we looked at each other like, what? Gilly? Wah! So we, we were so pumped for our buddy. So we ran down like five feet. There was a uh, payphone, called him. Gilly, you just got drafted by the New York Islanders. And, you know, and he was like, what? And he was a baseball player. Ended up playing baseball, like, on a, on a full ride. At, wow. I don't remember where, but he was a great athlete. And then we were like, Gilly? Like, it was the weirdest thing in the world. And then all of a sudden, as we're on the phone with them, Toronto had the next pick, the seventh round. And then they're like, from Governor Dummer Academy. And, I mean, you're talking about those small prep schools in Massachusetts. So my buddy and I looked at each other like, oh, now it's definitely. And it was my name. And then I, had, I swear. I mean, stop shocking to some of you, but I had three hot dogs that mustard right here. And I'm like, <laughs> I heard my name and I'm like, whoa, I We're, ran wearing down. the cheap suit. Oh, I wear the cheap <laughs> suit. And I, we, I ran down those stairs, man. I jumped the boards or whatever it was like the, and I went there and I was so pumped. They gave me a Jersey. I shook their hands. And you know, that's why I say the draft is such a fun experience. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, and it was awesome. And, and that's when I, you know, I realized I'm like, oh my God, maybe I can play one day. And then I, I never thought about it till then. And, and and to make the story even better, like a few rounds later, my roommate got drafted by Toronto, same team. And then my brother got drafted by New York Islanders. So it ended up being a great night. That's you know, we incredible. walked out of there. We had our jerseys. We felt like a million bucks. Wow. We thought we were so cool. And it was fun. I, I love the NHL draft, to your point. Yeah. Because they're the only sport that does the draft that way. Yeah. Where everybody is just in the same arena on the floor there. Awesome. And then they all walk up to the stage. You shake their hands with the jersey. Yeah. No other sport does it. It's weird. It's not how you would normally think to do it. Yeah. But I'm with you. I love it. So I, I hope they don't and, go and away from it. And even to finish on that, like, to be honest with you, like, even to, to keep going with that question you asked me, when did you know? I remember going around the table there, mm-hmm. and they're all there, right? Because there's, you know, everybody and the, you know, the, the staff. You, you probably have, like, 12, 15 guys around the table, and you go shake everybody's hand. And I remember thinking, like, well, I'm going to make these guys proud. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because then that, you no, know, for me, it gave me that that satisfaction. Like, all right, these guys believe in me somehow. Maybe I am good. I don't know. And that's when I realized, but I, I won't disappoint them. And I remember shaking their hands, and and that stayed with me. So I think it's a it's a big piece of. I mean, they're going to take it away. It kind of stinks, but it is yeah. what it is. Yeah. So you get drafted by Toronto. Yeah. You wind up in Denver a couple years later. Yeah. What were your emotions? <laughs> what were you feeling? Did, did you get traded to Denver? Did yeah. you sign? You got traded yeah. here. Yeah. So your, your dad traded yeah, for you. Yeah, he did. What, yeah. what was that whole experience? Yeah, well, like? it, it's kind of crazy. Uh, you know, so I, 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 I'm in Toronto. I, you know, when I end up playing for them a little bit, then uh, I get traded to LA, and then uh, 
you know, I, I, I have a good start to my career in LA. I've been there a few seasons. Yeah, I played with like Wayne Gretzky. Yeah, I played with Wayne. Wayne, you know, awesome. Oh, yeah, He's the well, best. Whatever. Oh, I was awesome, you know. And then, <laughs> yeah. And then all of a sudden, they got, you know, you're talking about stripping down a team. Like, they got, they treated everybody from Wayne to Yari Curry, Marty McSorley, Rick Talk. I mean, the list went on. And Rob Blake, former Av, mm-hmm. I was living with him at his house, and he was such a great guy. And, and we were told, like, oh, okay, we're the young guys and we're going to be, you know, the, the foundation. Not that I was a cornerstone of a franchise, but we're, we're talking about, like, you know, leadership with the younger sure. guys. I mean, I was younger, but I'd been now with the team for a few years. And and uh, we were told that, hey, we're going to strip it down, but we're going to turn things around and everything's going to go well. And you guys are a big part of it. Again, Blakey here and me here, it's a big difference. You know, we're talking about a real Hall of Famer, not not me. <laughs> and then, uh, but it was great. And 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 he went home to visit his parents um, in Simcoe, Ontario, because uh, it was the summer. And then I was in the hot tub. The draft was in St. Louis. Uh, there was another kid there at the house, and and he came over and he said, uh, "Hey, Sam McMaster's on the phone," which was a GM, our GM at the time. And I'm like, mm-hmm. ha, ha. so I'm thinking, yeah, that is real funny. You know what I mean? I'm in the hot tub. It's like three o'clock in the afternoon, yeah. and it was like a Friday or Saturday. Anyway. He gives me the phone, so I'm thinking it's Rob Blake Blakey. So I'm mm-hmm. like, "Hey, Sammy boy," you know, and it's my GM, and I'm being very disrespectful, like, you know, like, "Hey, how's things going?" Then I realize, like, after maybe 20 seconds, like, "Oh boy," you like, realize the tone isn't a very happy yeah, one. That's not Rob Blake, you know what I mean? And I, my heart sank, and I was like, "Oh my god, I got traded." Yeah, right? Because why is he calling me from St. Louis? You know what I mean? He's not asking me who they're going to draft. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so then he's like, no, this is a serious conversation. And I remember I was like, huh? And he's like, we've dealt your services. And I'm like, I was crushed, right? I couldn't hear anything. But, you know, it goes blind again. You're just like, oh, my God, I just built this thing. Like, why am I being dealt again? And he's like, well, you know where you're going. So it's nice. Uh, you know, thank you for your services. And I'm like, what was that? Rewind that. Where am I going? He goes, well, you know where you're going. And I'm like. Uh, nope, I have no idea. Why, why would I know where you're going? You're calling me to tell me I've been traded, and I, and I'm so hurt right there because I'm so depressed that I got mm-hmm. traded. Like it's been a 30 seconds, but I still can't get over it. It's a buzz in my ear, you know? and then he's like, "Well, you know where you're going." And again, I'm like, "Nope, I don't know where I'm going." He goes, "Well, Colorado," and I'm like, "Where?" He's like, "Colorado," and I'm like, "I said Colorado, what?" And he's like, "Oh my God, I am so sorry. I thought you knew." And I'm like, "I," I and then I was in shock. They yeah. just won the cup. Yep. Uh, about the week before, um, and I'm like, I had no idea. And then the phone rang. Two minutes later, it was Mark Crawford at the time, uh, was the coach, and he had been my coach in the minors with Toronto uh, in the American Hockey League. And he's like, Hey, listen, just want to let you know, like, we made a decision as an organization. We 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 threw Pierre out of the room. Again, this is what they told me, and it, you know, we decided that. We made the trade for you. It has nothing to do with them, obviously. And, you know, again, it helped that I'd been established in the league for a while sure. now. Yeah, so you which were, was, it was you were different. a real player. It was yeah. different, you know. And then, but that came in and it was so different and it was so weird. And I remember going, like, wow, this is so weird. And then people thought I knew. And of course, my mom didn't even know. And she's in the same house as him. And my dad was not the most media friendly guy, right? Mm-hmm. Not because he didn't like it. He respected the media. He just kept everything to himself under the vest. And, you know, whether it was a big deal or a smaller deal like this. And it ended up being awesome, to be honest with you, because for me, you know, and, you know, my wife's from here, met her here. My kids are all born here. Denver became our home. Denver's, you know, the Avalanche are a big part of our history, our family. And, um, love being part of that team. We, AJ calls it Avalanche 1.0, right? You know, and it's like the Sackick, the Forsbergs, the Wall. I mean, that team was sick. It was awesome to be part of. It was such a privilege to be part of it, and we were so good. Yeah. And 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 I was just a small part of it. But you look, and this is maybe where I became very um, friendly with Peter McNabb, the late Peter McNabb. He had played for his dad, mm-hmm. uh, obviously at the end of his career. And only in the record books, I'm going to say there's only four of us that played for their dads in the history of the National Hockey, which is a rare thing. Um, I think some guy beat me in like the 1930s or something like that. But uh, I'm playing, whatever it was, two seasons with the Avs. It's like number two in the history of the league. And Pete's number four, I think, one season in in Jersey. But it was funny because he always talked to me about that. And listen, it's all good. It's going to be fine. And so we had that in common. So Pete and I became close in that sense. Uh, and it was such a great, awesome 
fun few years uh, you're talking about learning so much and playing with legends and, and, and it was great until it was bad for you know for a little bit and it's a different story and you know it's not anything my dad did or i did or it's it just one of those days that day it just happened that next thing you know i was gone yeah and uh you know which was which was awful probably the worst day of my career but i'm not blaming anyone i am not uh stuff happens um you know i just Never really recovered after that as a player. It just mm. went downhill. I still lasted in the league another four years, but more on uh, being a good team guy. And, you know, <laughs> don't look at my stats, please don't. You know what I mean? It just went awful. Yeah. But uh, but it was awesome. It was a privilege to be part of the NHL, privilege to be part of uh, teams like this here in Denver. And uh, it, it was it was really something special. And you got to remember, these were, these were the, the the early years, you know, the 95, 96 season. They won, and I came in in 96, and it was still new, and everything was different. You know, like, it was Bronco country. It was, mm -hmm. you know, and the Nuggets were struggling at the time. Oh, and, they were and terrible. the Rockies had just been there, right, a couple of years before the Avs. And so it was different. People were just fell in love with the Avalanche, obviously having won, and it was a love affair right away. And it was fun because those guys, you know, including myself, like, we're uh, kind of the pioneers in town to, to build that foundation, that logo. You know what I mean? The history, the the legacy of that logo. So we take pride in that, a lot of us. And I think we, we really had a good time doing it. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, I want to ask you about those abs years and, and yeah. playing with all those guys. Got to hit yeah. a quick break first, but yeah. then uh, we'll get to that. Uh, guys, check out DraftKings Sportsbook. In the NBA, the game can change in an instant, and the NHL also. No matter how the action unfolds, you know DraftKings Sportsbook has your back. This week, new customers can score $150 instantly in bonus bets just for betting five bucks on basketball. Win or lose, you get an instant dub. Uh, Nuggets taking on the Rockets tonight in season tournament. So you can throw down five bucks on that game. If you're a new user, uh, instantly get $150 in bonus bets. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use code DNVR. New customers get $150 instantly in bonus bets for betting just five bucks on basketball only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code DNVR. The crown is yours. Also, make sure to check out Breckenridge Brewery, the official beer of DNVR. Uh, if you're local, stop into the DNVR, beer, DNVR bar. we got tons of Breck Brew on tap. Uh, if you're not local, check out the Breck Brew beer locator. Just type in your zip code. It tells you exactly where to get Breckenridge Brewery, no matter uh, where you are. So make sure to check out Breck Brew, the official beer of DNVR. All right, back here on the Denver Sports Podcast, special guest Eric Lacroix. So your avalanche years, you get here... Right after they win the Stanley Cup, yep. you're on a loaded team. Joe Sackick, Forsberg, Patrick Waugh. What was it like playing with those guys? It was awesome. Uh, it was fun for me because two parts. Like earlier in my career, I'm in L.A., and then you said it earlier, it's the Gretzky's and Yari yeah. Curry, McSorley. A lot of the old Edmonton Oilers, uh, you know, dynasty team, Charlie Huddy. Uh, my God, I'm missing a couple guys. But those guys were all in L.A. now. And they had one, but it wasn't fresh. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So you and could Gretzky see. And Gretzky was like mid 30s yeah. when you played yeah, with him. Yeah, it was towards the end. And yeah. then I ended up playing in New York after that with him on his last season. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I want to say, yeah, mid 30s at that time. Yeah, I think know? that's what yeah. it was. And then, uh, but it was those guys that were not fresh, you know what I mean, from, from winning. Um, and then we were struggling there. And then I ended up here in, in Colorado where they just won the Stanley Cup. My first year here, we won the President's Trophy for first overall, right, in, in the regular season. We It was a wagon. Like, that that team was unreal. And Joe was, you have that one-two punch, you know, the, the Sackick Forsberg, which is a lot like, well, they were both centers, which is a little different than McKinnon and Rantanen, but you're, it's that one-two punch. And, yeah. um, you know, we didn't have a Kale McCarr, but we had, you know, Patrick Hua and then, you know, Footy. And mm -hmm. you're talking about jerseys and the rafters. Guys were, they were unbelievable teams. And they were deep. And it was always about winning. And I remember, you know, being in L.A., we were all so like, I don't know, you're afraid to lose. And then you come to the Avs, and it's the old cliche, you expect to win every night. And I'll tell you one thing. But Claude Lemieux, Mike Keane, uh, secondary guys that it was always about winning. And, and you could see it in practice. It was... Everything was with a purpose for practice because mm -hmm. the purpose was to win. And, and I was saying that on the podcast the other day. Like, if you lost one game, it was the end of the world. And Joe used to say, we're the most miserable first-place team in the league. And, you know, for, for those reasons, because Patty Wah, 
Mike Keane, Claude Lemieux, they brought that mentality from the Montreal Canadiens back then. And it's in the playoffs, NBA, NHL, doesn't matter. When you lose two in a row, usually you're in deep trouble, right? You right. Know, so that's that mentality that if we lost the game, we weren't going to lose the next one. And it started right away from the first game of the season. Once you get to the playoffs, you've instilled that, you know, that, that belief that this is how we do things, you know. And then that's how these guys did it here. If you lost a game and that next practice, like everything had to be on point. You had to execute. You had to do everything the right way. And then if you weren't, those guys were on you. You yeah. know what I mean? And, and that's why I respected a guy like Mike Keane so much. You're talking about a guy that scored five goals a year, but so valuable to a team. It's unreal. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's it's you learn so much. And it's so good for Joe, you know, because Joe was the captain, but Joe's a quiet leader, right? Joe's not a rah-rah guy. Wasn't a rah-rah guy. Joe led by example and producing and night in and out of that pressure along. We all know that, like yeah. NBA, NHL. Those top end guys, yeah, they make the money, but they have the pressure to produce. And and I think having those guys come in took a lot of pressure away from Joe. And and he was able to just play. And then those guys, I don't want to say they're the mean guys, but I'm saying they were the guys that were dealing with the other stuff. And so if you lost one, you're on top of it in practice, and then usually we'd ride back on track, and then you never go in that skid. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So it was fun. It was, it was a special... Um, time for the avalanche back then and very similar to what they are today it's about winning and Mm -hmm. and it's about top heavy talent you know superstars yeah right you know what i mean which i mean look at the nuggets but Jokic and those guys i mean i think yeah i mean depth wins and you know but but yeah you need superstars right i mean i'm a big again i'm a i shouldn't say that because i was a deaf guy but but you need you, well, you, you being a depth guy, you would have the perspective on that. That's my point. Like yeah. you, you can't win. The other guys will help you win. The big guys will make you win. Yeah. And and it's hard to win without the big guys. And I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I believe in every sport is that way. Mm-hmm. Whether it's baseball, Nike. I mean, whoever it is, the cream always rises to the top. They live for the moment. Yeah, they're put in those situations maybe with better minutes in basketball or better ice time on the in the NHL, but those guys live up to the moment and usually they deliver. The winners usually do. Yeah. You were talking about how practices were like super competitive oh, yeah. with those guys, I'm guessing. I mean, like just take me inside the rink of, of like an Avs practice with yeah. Sackick and Forsberg and Waugh that season. Like how competitive is it? How like locked in is everybody every single day in that year? I'm going to compare it to, I'm using AJ's terms again, and, and Rudo, Avalanche 2.0, right? Like this summer, there was a lot of new guys coming in here with Miles Wood and Ross Colton and, you know, some guys that were free agents chose to come here. And, uh, and, and all of them were all saying the same thing, you know? There's a Nora here. You feel it. We just got here. Like, it's my first couple of practices. And I can tell it's different mm-hmm. uh, because it is about winning. And I think Nate brings that to McKinnon, right, with, I don't want to use the word swag because it's it's more the seriousness. And you know what I mean? And he brings it. And sure. it's, everybody's got to work and everybody's got to do it because there's a common goal. And, 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 and the Nuggets, I'm sure, you know, if you look at their championship run last year, if you look at their practices, I'm pretty sure they were freaking hard. Like yeah. it was like to the point, you can't mess around and you know what I mean? And all of a sudden, like all of a sudden expect results. Well, you know what you mean? said about new guys coming to the yeah. abs and immediately noticing yeah. it's different. That's what people say when they come to the nuggets. They're like, that's it. there's a different feeling here. You watch Nikola Jokic. He's the first one on the practice court. He's the last one to leave. He sets the example. It just feels different. It, it does. And, and then, even I remember, and I was gone, but I remember guys telling me stories like in, in 01, uh, you're talking about the second cup for the Avs, and a guy like Ray Bork that had been around the league for 20 years. And mm-hmm. and I remember Ray telling me a story like years later that, you know, he'd gotten here and there was a couple younger guys on the team. And one day his practice was over and he's like, he wanted to work on something. And all of a sudden he couldn't find the guy here or there. And I don't remember who it was. I'm not trying away from naming the player. I'm saying, uh, but. All of a sudden, Ray went back in the dressing room. He's like, what are you doing? We're going back to work outside. I know practice is over, but I'm almost 40 years old, and I got, you know, 
10 all-star games and we're working on this and and then you can go shower and you, yeah. you can go home so it is it's instilled within i always say coaches can do what they you know what they need to do yeah but the pressure from your peers from the inside nba nuggets avalanche pressure from your peers is the biggest thing and mm -hmm. and and those guys seem to have it the nuggets i tell you guys all the time i don't know much about the nuggets uh, about nba but all I know is if I watch the Nuggets, I know that they're good. And I know that they're probably going to win that game because there's a dominant force in Jokic. There's a dominant force in the extra guys. And, you know, yep. whether, I, you know, Murray and those. I always ask you guys questions because I'm not an expert on basketball by any means. But, but you can tell there's a swag and there's a belief they're going to win the game. Mm -hmm. Again, when it's 80 games a year, whatever it is. Everybody's going to have their dips like the Nuggets have had a little dip. The Avs had a dip last week. And, you know, but in a nutshell at the end of the year you'll have more win streaks than tough moments and then you yeah. hit the playoffs and there's a belief there's a swagger that you're going to win and that's why those teams have won championships the last couple of years mm -hmm. so you played for the Avs for two seasons two full seasons yep. um two very good teams you were on here in colorado um, and then I was reading a story about you asking to be traded. Well, that's the one I was saying earlier. I, I, everything's great. I, I love being here. It was awesome. Um, you got to remember, at the end of my second year, we we, we were up 3-1 in the first round to Edmonton. We lost in seven games. We, right. It just went sideways. And then uh, Mark Crawford ended up leaving. Um, it was a story there. And, you know, he ended up, he didn't get fired, but he was gone. The head Bob, coach Bob the time. Harley, yeah, Bob Harley came in. Uh, Bob started, so my third year here, I believe, again, I don't have the numbers, but I think we were like one, five, and one after seven, and that's not... So a really rough start It's a tough start. two great Bob years. Bob was, wasn't, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, it wasn't avalanche hockey, and, and then things went sideways a little bit, and, you know, like, uh, things were said in, in the broadcast on Hockey Night in Canada, and, you know, whatever, about the abs, and there's a problem, and... I seem to be the problem, and because I, <laughs> I'm like whatever that means. I'm a camera for management. I I would have to go back because it was kind of insulting, and but so it's like it's my mm -hmm. fault. And <laughs> again, love them to death, but I think Forsberg has zero points in those seven <laughs> games. You know, but it's so, all of a sudden it's my fault. Right, and I'm not because you have the That's same what, last well, name. Absolutely, as the GM. I, wrong, wrong place, wrong time. Right, it, it goes it goes both ways. Hmm. So all of a sudden, it, it just becomes an issue. Um, and then the issue becomes bigger. Then it becomes local. And then it's it's right. on the radio and the local. Then it's on the paper and the Denver Post. And then it becomes a little bit of a thing. Then you have a little bit of a team meeting. And then you're like, okay, you know what? I've never done anything wrong. I, I don't think anyone's done anything wrong. But I, I think this has escalated too far. And I'm just going to walk out. And I'm, I'm going to be gone by this afternoon. And that's what I did. Mm. So. so you went on to play a couple more years after that. Did you know you wanted to be in the front office or a front office um, after your playing career was yeah, done? Yeah, well, I've always loved hockey. It's my passion. And the way uh, you were talking about it earlier about like um, when you were even in prep school and yeah. like knowing what types yep. of guys you needed on different teams mm -hmm. and the chemistry of a team and like yeah. what made players great. Yeah. That sounded to me like a, a guy who would yeah. be destined for a front yeah, office. Yeah, that's what I mean. I've been lucky. And, and again, I, I, I do believe like leaving the Avalanche – had everything to do with my last name. You know, if my name was Wynn, like your last name, then I, I probably would have played a few more years here and mm -hmm. things would have gone well. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Stuff happens. And, sure. And I, and I do believe I was a victim of the last name. But now I go and then I try to survive for four years. It's not always easy as a pro athlete. It's not as easy as people think. And there's a lot of pressure and you want to stay there. And, and, and it's the day in and day out, the grind and... Uh, of trying to survive you know what i mean yeah. because yeah it is glamorous but it but it's not so glamorous when you're trying to hang on and you know and i i was worn out i was tired uh i finished in ottawa uh and we lost in the first round we were the best team in a one in the east it should have mm -hmm. been an avalanche versus uh, ottawa in the final it would have been unreal you know what i mean and <laughs> then we lost in the first round in toronto we were a young team we lost four straight then i was a little bit you know beaten down uh i didn't think it, my contract was over and then that summer i said to my wife i said if september comes around i got nothing I, i'm ready to move on like you know what i mean I, I just i think i'm 
I've squeezed it, all the you know the juice out of the lemon. I, there's not much left, you know what I mean? And I don't think I have the energy to, to fight through just to be an everyday player in the NHL. And, and that's if I get a job. Yeah. And uh, all summer was pretty dry. I didn't get much. Uh, I had an opportunity to go back in the American in the minors. And back then it was a little different with the waivers and everything. I was like probably gonna get buried down there. I I don't think I have the energy. No mm -hmm. offense to guys that did that. I just had been there, done that, didn't want to do it again. I mean, that's got to be a tough move for a guy it, who I played. It is tough. At you you played eight, level, nine years, and you you're going there. You know. So then I, you know, I, I just told my wife, this is, and then all of a sudden, July, uh, sorry, uh, September phrase came along. I saw Bob Hartley at the mall. Hey, how you doing? I'm like, I'm, I'm doing all right. He goes, Whoa, any news? Are you going anywhere? I'm like, Nope. And I said, I think I'm going to retire. I think I'm, I'm ready to move on. And he's like, what? And they had given this job of, you know, video coach slash part of the assistant, you know, be one of the assistant coaches and, you know, deal with the video and the breaking down of the games and uh, to Dave Reed that I just won the cup with them. And then Reader had decided to <clears throat> pack his stuff and go back east in Toronto because his kids were getting older. And, mm -hmm. you know, so then he's like, oh, my God, like, that'd be unreal. Like, you could take that if you're, if you're ready to move on and. You know, have you talked to your dad? Again, same thing. You know, no, I have not. You know what I mean? We don't, again, you have a relationship with the father, but when it comes to work, it's different. Like, I didn't tell my dad, no, I'm looking for a job with the abs, you know. So Bob was like, oh, that'd be awesome. So, you know what? I, he's like, let's talk tomorrow. So I talked to him the next day. He goes, hey, listen, if you want the job, it's yours. Be part of the coaching staff of the abs. And I was like, well, yeah, that's awesome. Because I, you know, I want to stay in hockey and talk about right place, right time. And as much as, the last name hurt, you know, four years before. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take advantage of it now, you know, right? Sure. Because why not? And then learned, uh, learned the front office and all that stuff. And I went back home, told my wife, this is it. <clears throat> Signed a deal with the abs on, on the coaching side. And they were going to Sweden for, you know, for training camp. And all of a sudden I got a phone call from Ottawa saying, hey, we'll give you a two-year deal. Really? And I was like, huh? Hold on a second. I mean, looking back now, I should have taken that, you know what I mean? Because, you know, it's not the same money as... Video coach, you know what I mean? But you know, <laughs> going back, it would have been, do, you're doing it for the money. And then I told yeah. my wife, I'm like, it took me five seconds. And I said, I think I'm at peace. Hmm. Let's move on. Let's jump in and let's jump in this stuff. And and we did. And we just went into head first and never looked back and never regretted the decision. So it was it was fun. You know, it was fun to be part and learn from from great people like yeah. here, you know. So you you work up from assistant video coach yep. to director of ho hockey operations yep. I was reading you also had a stint co-owning the Arizona Sun Dogs. Yeah, yeah. What was that like? It was awesome. So you you know the, the one of the lockouts came and all of a sudden you're 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 trying to grow within the profession. You're trying to grow within the okay, ranks. Okay, so that was during one of the yeah, lockouts. Yeah, it was okay. right here. So I was like, you know, and and the Colorado Eagles that are now the Abs, this, you know, American Hockey League team, Ralph Bastrom, Chris Stewart, uh, they built that franchise down there. That's that's been an unbelievable success for whatever it is so many years now over 20 years and those guys are still going on strong and so with the abs here we had a lockout so we had a goalie problem we we needed a net right as a goalie there's only two nets so so we put one of our prospects in with the eagles mm -hmm. which was at that time part of the central hockey league and um so i be, became friends with, with, with ralph and you know and the operation it was so cool it sold out i mean it's been sold out for 20 years and i was like wow and then i kind of got friendly with the Gary Bettman of you know of the league at the time, which was Brad Trelevin, which is now the GM of Toronto Maple Leafs, and uh, Brad was awesome. And then he's like, "Well, you guys should get a franchise." And then it's like, "Oh, okay." Then, oh, all right, let's put your money where your mouth is, and you know what I mean. And then all of a sudden, you make mistakes that are less magnified from you know the the, the front office of, of mm -hmm. teams like the NHL, and you go and you make your own mistakes, and uh, and then we loved it. I mean, it was awesome. So we actually bought Grand Junction. Uh, and it never came to fruition because they were building buildings and you know like the Bud Center, which is now the Blue Arena, whatever it is. But it just never worked out. And then they said to us, "Well, Prescott Valley, which is about an hour and a half north and of, of Phoenix, and yeah. that's ready to go. You guys want it?" So my my buddy Sean Fowler and I like we just jumped on it, and then we became part owners of the Arizona Sun Dogs. And it was fun. It was awesome. It was just learning on the go and learning to deal with different things of the front office which is a great experience and yeah. then even went behind the bench those years with with our coach and uh so it was a fun two three years and 
uh, build it from scratch and from uniforms to you know to the building to yeah. everything. It's fun. Like it's just different. It's yeah. a great experience. And young kids at the time. And then we we're like, oh, let's sell this and let's get back to. So I went back afterwards, and then you feel more prepared for whatever comes after. And mm -hmm. it was a great experience. We had Nuggets GM Calvin Booth on the show yeah. a couple months ago. And before he started in an NBA front office, he operated his own AAU team. Yep. And he was saying a lot of the same things. Yeah, like, yeah. you get to actually see <laughs> how you would want to run a team, but with way less stakes. <laughs> you, you know? Way less magnified, you know yeah. what I mean? But you could, he even talked about the uniforms and, like, just yeah. how he wanted to set everything up and, and run everything. And I, I think he believes that that gave him, like, a – a nice base level of how he wanted to eventually run things when he ascended to the top of the NBA. And there's the difference probably between him and myself. Like, was uh, I, we got to do, and we took so much pride in, in building the logo and using companies here that, you know, Adrenaline back then, was, which had done the, the logo for the Nuggets and the Abs, obviously, and uh, those, those, those companies. And it was from scratch and that's mm -hmm. why it's like a baby right you take so much pride of it but what i learned a lot about myself in there too because i'm not gonna lie to you and tell you uh i never thought about becoming a gm in the nhl like because you're like oh i'm so lucky right now and you gotta remember at that time we had craig billington as well that just kind of stepped away last summer from, with the avalanche and biller was a, obviously a backup goalie uh here and you know and really kind of enjoyed my dad my dad enjoyed him and we always told him when your career is over come and come and talk to me and, and that's what biller did when talk to to my dad when his career was over and i remember pierre telling biller and myself like not that he thought he was the man he's saying i'm gonna give you guys opportunities like he called it like the harvard education of hockey like we're gonna let you guys touch everything mm -hmm. so even here within the building we were we would go deal with the you know the minor league team we would go yeah. deal with the prospects go deal with ticket sales Go deal with with cranky sports people like you know Mark Wagner guys like that in in finance and and you're learning so much and then that's kind of what peaked at me to, to to try something in the in the minor leagues where it's less magnified and I learned a lot about myself there saying oh my God I could never be a GM not a chance you know what I mean <laughs> it's true and I was like it's not my personality it's not me I'm like a, when I was playing I'm a secondary guy I'm a, I'm a bottom six guy and. I'm a, I'm a guy that can help others. And, and I became very real, realistic about what my job was going to be over the years. And, and I never stepped outside. The toughest thing sometimes is to evaluate yourself, right? As a player. Absolutely. 100%, yeah. right? And then I realized, I'm like, this is not what I am. And I, you know, so I always went for, no, I can be, <clears throat> you know, a secondary, third, fourth uh, guy, you know, not, not a top end guy. And, and I always stuck within my limits. And that's why I think I always, had you know fun and always respected others for the job that they do because those are tough seats. Uh, I'm sure he talked about it. Uh, there, how, how many teams in the NBA is it? Is it 32? So this is like the NHL. So there, there are 32 seats like that in the world. Those are tough seats. I'm sorry, 30. 30, 30, whatever. 32 in the NHL. So yeah, you're talking about <coughs> in respect to sports, like whether it's 30 or 32. Like there's only 32 chairs in the NHL like to, to be in there. I there's only so many of those jobs. There's yeah. only so many of those jobs and they're tough jobs. Yeah. And you got to be able to do it. And that's why I think Chris has been unbelievable here with the Avalanche McFarland. I'm a big Chris McFarland fan. I am and I respect and I think he knows what I know, you know, because of it's your dad. It's your, you know what I mean? It's 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 personal. Like mm -hmm. you see what the pressures of the those people go through in those chairs and and i tell one of my buddies like brad chelving all the time like what is wrong with you man you you, you must hate your life to want to be in that chair yeah. especially in toronto like and yeah. you know it, the pressure that you have to go through and and i respect those guys and and that's why i said i raised mm -hmm. my hat to chris mcfarland here or booth with the nuggets and those are tough positions to be in and sure when you win it's fun but we all know when you don't win then they're the first ones to get criticized and absolutely and they're able to take it and usually move and you know thrive from it and do something else to, to get it right back on track yeah got to hit one final break <coughs> uh to finish up though i want to ask you a couple questions about this abs team right yep. now uh which we'll get to on the other side here guys breck distillery if you're looking for a great holiday gift Check out Breck Distillery, Breckenridge Bourbon, the official bourbon of the Denver Broncos ticket contest. Um, tons of awesome options from Breckenridge Distillery. If you've ever been into the bar, we've got Ricky Seltzers here, which are just 
they taste great. They're made with Breck spirits. Uh, maybe you've had Breckenridge Distillery out at our Broncos tailgate before, uh, but Breckenridge Distillery products are available in all 50 states. Shop your local retailer or visit Breckenridge Distillery for home delivery of award-winning Breckenridge spirits uh, anywhere, anytime. Uh, Breck Distillery, an, an awesome product. We drink it a lot here in the bar. So if you're looking for a holiday gift, Breckenridge Bourbon, Breckenridge Distillery, they got tons of great options uh, for anybody. Also want to tell you guys about Factor Meal Kits. I got sent a bunch of these uh, a couple weeks ago. I got sent like five or six Factor Meal Kits. Five days later, they were all gone. Two minutes in a microwave, that's all these take. And they're actually legit good. I've had a lot of like pre-made meal stuff before. These Factor Meal Kits are really good. Great variety. If you're too busy throughout your daily life to cook yeah. just pop these in the microwave for two minutes they're good to go um so head to factormeals.com slash uh dnvr50 slash dnvr50 get 50 percent off code dnvr50 at factormeals.com uh, slash dnvr50 to get 50 percent off your order all right back here on the denver sports podcast with harrison win special guest eric lacroix this Avs team, in my amateur hockey watcher opinion, yep. it has some similarities to, you know, the great Avs teams we were talking about in terms of just the star power. How do you think Nathan McKinnon and Kale, McK Kale McCarr compare to like the star power and just the culture that a Joe Sackick and Peter Forsberg established? Yep. When, when you were their teammates. So similar, uh, and that's why it's 1.0, 2.0. Uh, built very similarly, like, you know, with star power. Mm -hmm. um, I think Joe's got a lot to do with it, and, and I love the fact how Joe did it the last 10 years just by being true to himself. Joe's he's not trying to be someone. He wasn't trying to be, for example, Pierre, you know, like I, I, his GM that he had for a lot of years here. And also, he's doing it his way, mm -hmm. you know, because that's – who he is and he's not trying to be somebody else. you can look back and take different things that you've learned over the years but at the end if you're trying to copycat someone it's not going to work and and i think that's why i love chris mcfarland so much too as much as what he's doing right now with the team he's not trying to be joe yeah. even though joe's still there when i'm saying this but there's a combination and you got to act the way you are as a person and i think that's what's been great and then if you look at those teams, they're so heavy, and then the the superstars produce, and and, mm -hmm. and they they put the pressure on themselves, and that's why I have so much respect back then for Joe and Peter and um, and Patrick, and because it was always about winning, it was never about individuals, it was about winning, it was about the team, and success came with it, and everybody respected one another. It sounds to be like it's the same thing now. They're so fun to watch now. They're so well built. Kel McCarr. So humble, and you know, so, and I'm not saying Nate and, but everybody's different, right? Nate's yeah. more serial, you know, like, you know, and then, you know, Ranton is more goofy, and you know, like, which is nice. And everybody has their own personalities, and no different than Jokic and all those guys. And, but it's fun to see because they, they want to do it for each other. Yeah. They want to win. It's about winning. And if you go back at that Avalanche 1.0, maybe if you look at that 10, 10 years, whatever, 10 year, uh, segment yeah they won two cups they've lost like i don't know i don't know five six times in the in in the conference final um i do believe that this 10 year segment you know for this this avalanche squad starting with a couple years ago yeah they can easily win mm -hmm. you know two and you go back and if you talk to these guys, I was gone by them, but they always go back and they're like, we should have won three or four. You yeah. know what I mean? They lost to Dallas twice. And so there was a no six and no one and sorry, 96 and then no one. But you know, the 98, 99, they feel that it slipped away from them. Mm -hmm. Again, looking back, still a successful season when you lose in a conference final and, you know, but then again, when you want to win it, it's disappointing. Uh, I do believe this edition can have that span of 10 years, you know, where, you know, hopefully they win two, but I, I do believe they'll win more than two if they don't let like a third or a fourth one slip away like, uh, you know, that 1.0 where those guys are just as good now as, as that addition back then. And, yeah. and, and they're fun to watch. They're young. 
salary cap era, a little different than back then, but they're so well built right now that the core is intact and they're going to be good for years to come. McKinnon and McCarr, obviously, they're trending to be all-time greats oh, yeah. in, in at the in NHL history. Yeah. How high do you think they can climb on yeah. on some of these all-time lists? Like, I'm obviously not a hockey historian, but top yeah. ten, yeah, defenseman of all time. Yeah, can Kale McCarr? Yeah, can he eventually mm. break into that? tier of just greatness and, and i'll say some that doesn't make me a genius or uh nate's different you know like there's so many good forwards in the history of the league and uh and i always say joe peter for me and and, and wayne because i play with him, our top 10 of all time but it's hard to look back in 50 years ago i wasn't there i don't know i mean you know yeah. the names but it's hard to compare eras but um, this is funny because in the NBA, we are fine comparing eras, <laughs> yeah. even though it doesn't make sense. I know. I'm fine but with th it, too. This, but this I, is yeah. actually the correct yeah. way to view it. I, I, it's impossible I, to I'm do it. I'm fine with it, too. But I'm like, I don't know. I'm sure if you talk to guys from 50 years ago, they're going to be like, listen, Bobby Orr was That's better. That's the responsible right? thing to yeah, say. Exactly. But I, we live in the moment, right, which is normal. But here's what I'll say. Like, Nate is unbelievable. I mean, this guy's. He has 11 points in five games last week, and everybody thinks he's in a slump. And it's like, really? Like, you know, which is a lot for hockey, right? Um, but Makar, I'm going to say this, like, and I said it before, and I'll say it again. It doesn't make me a genius because a lot of people are starting to say it. He's so young. I think when it's all said and done, I think he just breaks every record book. I mean, I, I just – he is so different, so special, um, and I say it all the time. I got a crush on him as a player. Like, I – I'm at family sports. I watch him. I'm like, things he does in practice. I'm like, this is not right. This is not, it shouldn't be legal. Like it's a, nobody else can do what he does. And people try to emulate him or, or do the same thing as him. And, and it's funny because in youth hockey, I get all, I get mad at those young kids. And they're like, well, Kale McCarr did. I'm like, I know, but you're not Kale McCarr. He's Kale you know McCarr. I mean? <laughs> He's yeah. Kale McCarr. And it doesn't make you a bad player. You feel so bad telling the kid that, but it's like, yeah, it's not going to work for you. And and, that's, and you might end up being a National Hockey League player, but this is Kel McCarr. This would be if, like, a young you kid know? tried to do a Sombor shuffle like no, Nicole Jokic the, You see does. what I mean? It's just like, like yeah, bro, it's, you, you can't buddy, do you're that. You'll catch, you know? So I think when it's all said and done, uh, and, and some people are starting to say it, too, and I say with confidence, I think he's, I think he breaks everything and he ends up, you know, one of the greatest of all time on the back end because he's so different, mm -hmm. he's so unique. And it's so different than everybody else before him. I mean, they're, they're, he's paving the way for basically how 25, 30 minutes, which is a lot in hockey, like out of 60, uh, if you play. He just controls the game the whole time. That's why. And I'm not taking anything away from, from Nate or, or Miko or, you know, high-end yeah. guys like that. But this guy makes it where it's like, whoa. I think when it's all said and done, he'll be right there at the top. Who are some of your favorite Avs guys to watch that aren't, you know, the, the top – and start yeah. talent guys. Well, I love Logan O'Connor. I think everybody uh, can attest to that. Like you know, they all everybody you know rooting for him. It's like undrafted guy and you yeah. know, played at DU and he just works every shift. And and I like guys like that. I like uh, um, I really like Colton and Wood. You know what they're providing, which for me was a little bit what I had to do. You know, sure. so you kind of see yourself a little bit in those guys. Those guys are so much better than me. And you know, that's not what I'm saying, but but it's fun to watch that. And then you know, of course, Nate and those guys and, and Kale, but one guy that I've always liked and I really like him is, is Rantanen. You know, mm -hmm. and again, I wasn't close to being Rantanen, but I just like the way he plays the game, the way his ascension to the top of the league's been like this, like this, like this, and he gets yeah. better every year, you know, and it's, you're talking about, he's not a first overall pick, he's a 10, 10th overall pick, still pretty, but it's not like, you know, a generational guy, but he's turning into a cornerstone of a franchise, and that's an outstanding pick by the Avs like a few years back and, you know, played some time in the American League just to learn his craft. And sure, I enjoy him because I think he's clutch. I think he, he respects the game. He seems to have a good time doing it. And again, I don't know him personally. I've said hi to him a couple of times, but very impressed by that guy. And, and if you look back, you're like, oh, he's a winger. I was a winger. Like, oh, my God, if I could have been good, I would have liked to be him. You know what yeah. I mean? And again, but I respect all those other guys. But Rantanen would be my guy. Nice. Nice. 
I mean, I have a million more questions, but yeah. I, that's all the time wow, we got. Good, man. good, man. I told you I can go all day. Yeah, yeah. you you weren't lying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Eric, appreciate you coming on and, and giving us that, some time yeah. and dropping some knowledge. Uh, guys, thanks for tuning in. Uh, if you could, if you're watching live, leave us a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. We'd really appreciate it. And we'll be back with another guest next week on the Denver Sports Podcast. Talk to you guys then. We all silly like the mayor.